um, as Liana has, has um, outlined, <clears throat> this is going to be about um, a group of insects called the shield bugs and allied families. And it's going to be very much a sort of ov overview of the, of the group um, in terms of the British fauna, looking really um, at lots of ecological factors. Um, and then I'm going to go on to discuss some recent progress that's been made with the recording scheme and talking about species which have arrived recently um, and, and that, kind of, that kind of thing. So by way of introduction, let's think about how do we define these insects? Um, what do we mean when we talk about this group uh, of shield bugs and allies? Well, as some of you have noticed, we're, we're in the Hemiptera, and these are insects with two pairs of wings, uh, and they have this very characteristic feeding tube called a rostrum, um, <clears throat> which is essentially uh, allows them to pierce and suck um, animal and plant fluids. So they, they have these piercing and sucking mouth parts. And then within the Hemiptera, we're in the Heteroptera, so these are insects which have a very leathery basal part of the forewing with a, a membranous tip. Um, so the forewings are divided and they also overlap around a, a usually rather big scutellum. Then below that we're in this infraorder pentatomorpha. And within that, there are three superfamilies which, which constitute this, this major grouping that we're talking about today. So we've got the pentatomoidea, uh, which are the more typical shield bugs, and that's 45 species in, in six families. Then the choreoidea, including the choreidae mainly, that's 25 species in four families. And then in the pyrochoroidea, it's a massive tropical group, um, but there's just one species uh, in Britain. And in fact, I think there's only two in Europe, certainly not very many. Right, so that gives us a total of 71 species in these three superfamilies. Now, in fact, probably slightly more than that, because there are a couple of species which are probably present in Britain, but they haven't been 100% confirmed yet. Um, and these are, uh, is a Sydnid, a species of Sahirus, um, and a Ropalid, but uh, I haven't added those officially to the, to the British list. Um, because they're not not entirely, we're not entirely sure about that, um, with, with you know, with um, with great certainty. So if we think about these three three superfamilies and how they they themselves are defined, the, all the species in the Pentatomoidea, these are the more typical shield bugs. They all have five antennal segments. They have two or three tarsal segments, and they always have ocelli, which are um, the simple eyes that are present on the top of the head. Uh, the Choreoidea, by contrast, always only have four antennal segments. They always have three tarsal segments, and again, they have these ocelli, which are the, um, the simple eyes, un unlike the very large compound eyes, which are on the side of the head, ocelli are much smaller eyes um, present on the top. The Pyrochoroidea, um, they the same as chore Choreoidea, but they do not have ocelli, uh, so they're completely lacking these simple eyes. So I'll go through the families within these main groupings and talking about some or all, in some cases, of the British representatives within them. So we're in the Pentatomoidea, and this first family is the uh, Acanthosomatidae. So this is comprises four species in Britain, and they're all shown on this slide. So we've got the birch shield bug at the top here, a hawthorn shield bug, a juniper shield bug, and the parent bug. And they're all quite common uh, and widespread species, in fact, things you may well find. They're all quite large bugs, they're, they're shield shaped, and they've all got two segmented tarsi. So this is a really diagnostic and important feature. Another thing that they all have is on the underside of the abdomen, they have a forward pointing spine. And this is quite a unique feature for the family. And in fact, in the British fauna, it's only shared by one other species. And this is the 
pentatomid shield bug, Raphigaster nebulosa. So that's Raphigaster is a very unusual example of a pentatomid that has this, this feature, which is normally only found in Acanthosomatids. So they're all plant feeding, they're phytophagous, they overwinter as adults. And as I said before, they're all common and widespread. And you may well be familiar with this um, parent bug here at the bottom. This is one of the few um, British shield bugs which uh, exhibits quite strong parental care. So there you can see uh, female brooding an egg batch. Right, so if we move on to the pentatomidae, so there's 25 of these, and these are what we regard as the really sort of classic group of, of shield bugs. So yes, they're very shield shaped bugs again. They're, they're varying in, in size from quite small to really quite large. They all have a big scutellum, um, but the scutellum rarely reaches the end of the abdomen, except in this one species here, uh, the turtle shield bug, Podoptinuncta, where you've got this really big scutellum, which covers the whole of the abdomen. So in these others, the scutellum is, is large and triangular, but it doesn't reach the, the tip of the abdomen. As well as the Phytophagus species, which make up most of them, there are four species which are exclusively predatory. These are in a separate subfamily. And <clears throat> these are the heather shield bug, Rachignathus punctatus, um, the blue shield bug, Zychrona, the spine shield bug, um, Pychromerus, and um, the bronze shield bug, Troilus luridus. And, and these have quite specific um, preferences in terms of what they like to prey on. So the heather shield bug is very specifically associated with the heather leaf beetle. Um, and you'll often only find it where you have high densities of um, of the heather leaf beetle. Um, equally, Zychrona is very strongly associated with Altica leaf beetles, flea beetles, um, which are blue, the same, the same colour, in fact, uh, as Zychrona. And this is a case of aggressive mimicry. So the, the Zychrona uh, adults are actually resembling the prey. Um, Pychromeris bedens here, which is shown at the bottom, uh, this feeds on various caterpillars, um, not just Lepidoptera, but things like sawflies as well. And similarly, uh, Troilus luridus also feeds on a lot of caterpillars, but it, it will also um, take adult, adult insects, beetles and so on. It's probably the least fussy. So there's quite a lot of pentatomids that you will find. You'll be very familiar with some of them, particularly things like uh, this common green shield bug, which is a, a widespread garden species. However, some are, some are very rare. So moving on to the Sydney D, uh, there are nine of these, possibly 10. And they're all very uh, somber in color usually. The, the, mo the most colorful they get is sort of metallic. Um, or black and white, but they're mainly, mainly mostly black. Uh, and they have these strong spines on the legs, which they use for burrowing. And so they're very ground dwelling, very strongly associated with uh, a terrestrial habit. And they do in fact burrow under the ground as well. And in the tropics, they can, they can burrow really quite deep. Um, but here they're, they're all quite small and probably don't go down terribly far, but they were probably overwinter underground perhaps. They're, they're all phytophagous plant feeding and most of them are what we call monophagous. So that means that they have a specific food plant association. So for example, this species here, the cow wheat shield bug uh, is only found um, feeding on cow wheat. So it's really quite a fussy creature. Uh, this is the forget-me-not shield bug and Although that's usually on forget-me-nots, it's actually on lots more um, plants in that family now. So things like uh, green alkanet um, and uh, other species in the Bor Boriginaceae uh, are, are used. All of these overwinter as adults, and they, they include some quite interesting species, including um, the very, very rare Cornish shield bug, 
Geotomus punctulatus, which is only found in Britain at one site in, in Cornwall, in uh, Senan Cove, uh, White Sands Bay area. And also the closely related Geotomus petiti, which is a very recent arrival, which has turned up at Dungeness just the year before last. So moving on to Scutelleridae, this is a small family in Britain, but uh, very diverse in the tropics. There are just four species. Uh, again, they're typically shield-shaped bugs. They have a very, very big scutellum, which uh, gives rise to their name. So the scutellum reaches right to the tip of the abdomen. And again, the plant feeding, um, feeding these two species here are Eurogaster species, and they feed on grasses. And these two are Odontoskelis. And like Sydneys, really, they're very strongly ground dwelling and they feed on low growing herbs, usually things like stalks bill. And most of them overwinter as adults. In fact, one of the Odontoskelis does overwinter as a nymph. These are all quite uncommon. The only really one that you're likely to find is, is uh, Eurogaster testudinaria. So the Thyria corridae, this is sometimes now included within the Sydneys. so the, the family's sort of been junked by some authorities, but um, I, I include it as a separate family here. Again, uh, the scutellum covers most of the abdomen, um, but not, in not the entirety of the abdomen. You can just see that semicircle of wing membrane there. And it only in includes one species in Britain. Uh, the so-called scarab shield bug. This is Thyrocoris scaraboides, and it's the smallest shield bug in Britain, uh, very strongly ground dwelling, and it's found usually on calcareous soils underneath violets. So you'll find this by, by grubbing around, um, running pitfall traps, or using a, a very powerful suction sampling machine to lift insects from the ground surface. And a lot of these ground dwelling species of shield bugs are difficult to find and they are much more easy to uh, record if you're using these sorts of techniques. Um, particularly suction sampling is, is a very uh, quick and easy way of discovering these. Um, but if you've got a lot of time to spend then just searching underneath and around the food plant being very careful and meticulous. Um, it's time consuming but it will, uh, it will be successful given, in, you know, given enough time. So this is a really wacky species and this is actually a new family for Britain, the Plataspidae. Um, and <clears throat> this was first discovered here a couple of years ago, it's still only known from one site and whether it even occurs there is, is um, uncertain. And it's a species called Coptosoma scutellatum, and it's got a really weird convex shape. And um, from above, it's sort of uh, like a trapezium in shape. So Graham Lyons, who discovered it, um, basically asked me if, if we could call it the trapezium shield bug. And I, I thought, yeah, that's not a bad name, actually, Graham. I'll let you have that one. It's a really weird thing. So you can see that the scutellum is completely covering the abdomen and you can't see the wings at all. And in the males, you've got this uh, very strange, um, very visible genital segment at the, the tip of the abdomen. You can see almost, you can even see it from above, in fact. It's almost like a plant hopper. It's a very small species, uh, very unobtrusive, so it could well be, could well be here uh, in other places and overlooked. Uh, on the continent, it's quite widespread and it feeds on lots and lots of different species of, of legumes. But here it was found on Dyer's greenweed, um, and, but there may well be, be other food plants that get used here in, in the long term. So that's a, a, a really interesting one. So moving into the second subfamily now, the Corioidea and the Choreidae, this contains 11 species. Um, and they're all quite stoutly built bugs, really. They're often called leather bugs, have this leathery texture. They have um, the very um, tuberculate surface of the head and pronotum and often the, the first antennal segment as well. And they're often 
very strongly ground dwelling as well. So this species, Bathysola nubilis, has a common name of the cryptic leather bug because it's so hard to find. And it's really very, very slow moving. Even on an incredibly hot day, this thing barely gets going. And you'll be grubbing around underneath the food plant for some time um, to look for it. And indeed, lots of people I know have never found this, although it isn't as rare as it used to be. Again, it's something that is more easily found uh, in a, using a pitfall trap or, or a suction sampler. Um, all the Choraeids are, are phytophagous again, plant feeding. They all overwinter as adults. And there are two species that are really common, the dock bug, Choraeus marginatus, and the denticulate uh, leather bug, Choreomeris. And this group does include uh, this recently arrived species, Leptoglossus uh, occidentalis, which you may uh, be familiar with. And I'm gonna talk a bit more about that later on in, in this talk. So the Ropalidae, again, there's about 11 species. And these are also quite stoutly built bugs, although there are two very different looking species, Myrmus miriformis and Chorosoma. And these are very elongate, those two. But the more stoutly built bugs, uh, they often have <clears throat> not just the uh, membranous tip, of the wings made of uh, membrane. They also have the basal region um, rather membranous too. So if we look at this Ropalus subrupus, I'm talking about this part of the wing here, you can see it's transparent and membranous in the same way uh, as the tip of the membrane here. They're all uh, phytophagous. Oh, they have very closely packed veins in the wing membrane. In fact, so closely packed, you can hardly see each individual vein. Um, they all overwinter as adults, and there's about four or five common species. So the four of the commonest species are shown here. There's Ropalus subrufus, Chorizus, Myrmus miriformis, and Stictopleurus punctata nervosus are all, all pretty common now. The Elididae, uh, this is again more of a tropical family, but not very diverse in Britain and Europe. And there's just one species in Britain, uh, Elidus calceratus. And defining feature of these is that they have quite a long final antennal segment, the fourth segment, and it's always curved. Now this species is black usually or dark brown, but when it flies, it shows this red abdomen uh, resembling um, a pompylid wasp, a spider hunting wasp. And this is a, a classic case of Batesian mimicry. Now, it used to be thought that these were myrmecophilus and that they actually were associated with ants. But although the nymphs resemble wood ants, it's probably not the case. And they probably don't develop within ants' nests. They're certainly not that difficult to find in the right habitat. They're probably, um, well, they're almost certainly phytophagus as well. And they're not predatory. That used to be another common misconception that this was a predatory species. But... It's, it's almost certainly not. It's a local, um, a local bug. The best way to see this is to go to some lowland heath um, where it can be quite frequent. <clears throat> but in southeast England, you, you can also find it in um, post-industrial habitats and brownfield sites uh, and also acid grassland too. Now, this is a, an interesting family, the Stenocephalidae. So it's, it's a family that only contains one genus, and this is the, the genus Dicranocephalus. And all of these species feed on spurges, euphorbia species, and they're called spurge bugs commonly. They're all large and quite dark in color. They have these black and white banded legs for sort of black and cream, and also black and cream banded antennae. They all look quite similar, all the species in, in that genus. Um, we have two species in Britain. They also have two projections at the front of the head. Um, the two in Britain are both quite rare. So we've got Dicranocephalus medius, which is usually in woodlands on wood spurge, and also Agilis, which is more of a much more of a coastal species. This is on sea spurge uh, and Portland spurge. However, in the last few years, people have been recording uh, medius on other spurges, um, particularly ornamental spurges 
hybrids um, and um, cultivated cultivated forms of spurge and and it looks like it's starting to spread into other habitats as a result so it's um it's moving into gardens in particular and this is this is quite interesting so this will this will be a recurring theme in this talk um, <clears throat> species expanding their their host plant range and as a result being able to actually uh, expand their their, their distributions um, and spread to become much more widespread than they, they formerly were. In the pyrochoroidea, um, <clears throat> we've just got this one family, pyrochoroidae, and this is just represented by one species in Britain. Um, as you might know, it's called the firebug. It's very black and red uh, in colour, and it was always a very rare species. Uh, it feeds on mallows, um, malva, um, tree mallow in particular, and also weirdly on, on the seeds of lime trees. Now, it's usually short winged. Uh, you can see here, the wings are ending there, and this is the abdomen here, you can see. Um, however, it does sometimes produce macropterous forms, which are shown here. So here, this is wing membrane, so this bug can, can fly, this one can't. And yes, only the macropterous forms are able to, to fly and therefore disperse effectively. Right, so a bit of background to the recording scheme. So <clears throat> about 10 years ago, um, myself and Jim Flanagan took over the terrestrial bug recording schemes. And it was decided at that point to create a separate recording scheme for shield bugs because <clears throat> Although it's not a very large group of species, they were becoming quite popular and they did represent the bulk of the records. And it seemed like a good idea to sort of future-proof the recording scheme um, and do that. And ironically now, we're probably gonna to have to subdivide it even further. Um, so the group includes many large distinctive species, which are really popular um, amongst recorders. They can often be easily identified in the field, um, particularly now that everyone has a phone with a camera in, um, just taking a quick snap in the field will usually result in an identification uh, later on, even if it can't be done at the time. So they're a, a really nice sort of entry level group, um, with a few exceptions, I must say that. Um, and they are getting harder as, as more species arrive from the continent. That's, that's definitely the case. So just a sort of history of what development, what main developments have, have occurred really in relation to this group. We had uh, in 2016, <clears throat> we had a, a species status review um, published to covering all these species and this reassessed their conservation status. It wasn't based on a massive number of records, in fact. Um, this was just data collated up to 2014, it was about 30,000 records. And I also used a slightly larger data set um, after that to produce a provisional atlas. And both of these are available as PDF downloads. So the um, status review you can find on the, um, on the Natural England website and the Provisional Atlas is on the British Bugs website uh, on the front page. So since 2014, we've received loads and loads more data, and this is largely due to the success of iRecord, which you probably uh, are, are all familiar with. This is a, a specific online recording facility produced by, by the Biological Records Centre covering the British fauna. So this has been really, really beneficial for, for shield bugs. And now if we move on to looking at the kinds of trends that these species have shown. So a lot of them have increased encouragingly. And this is really largely because they are warmth loving insects. And many of them for many years were at the northern edge of their range here. And if we think about the number that are found further north, and um, particularly in Scotland, it's not really that many, only about 15% of the, of the British fauna is found there. I think that figure of 12 may be slightly higher now. Um, I think it might be 14 species, but it's still not very high. 
And there's been a lot of change to the British fauna in the last 20 years, particularly the last decade. And as I've said, most, most of these have been positive, positive trends. And it looks very likely that, that the bulk of these changes are attributable to, to a gradually warming climate. And this is often accompanied by a host plant shift. So exploiting um, new sources of food, basically. And this phenomenon is often called ecological release. So it, it, in ecological terms, it, it refers to a population increase or, or population explosion that occurs when a species is freed from, from limiting factors in, its, in, in their environment. So in this case, in the case of the shield bugs, these limiting factors are almost certainly climatic. So this makes them really, really sensitive biological indicators of climate change. And there are quite a few other insect groups which are also uh, in this group. So things like um, aculeates, uh, bees and wasps are also very good biological indicators of, of a gradually warming climate. Uh, and, and grasshoppers and bush crickets are, are another one. These are all groups that we call thermophilic. So that is to say that they, they really like warm temperatures uh, and <clears throat> warm temperatures enables them um, to spread. So if we go through a couple of these, these species which have really done very well over uh, the last 20 years, um, one of these, which is uh, I'm sure very familiar to, to most of you, is the common green shield bug, Palomina. Now, actually, if you go back to the sort of 1980s and before, this wasn't that common. Um, it was primarily a southern thing, and it was very often um, on, on hazel coppice. And it wasn't really that common in gardens. It wasn't ubiquitous. It was, you know, it was, it was slightly fussy. Um, Compare that with now and it's absolutely everywhere. So there's been a, a, a very steady northward spread by this species. And in fact, in, in 2019, um, it, it reached the Scottish borders um, and it's now present along um, the southern coast of Scotland along here. These, these records up here are, are imports. They, they relate to imported specimens. You can see, uh, with this distribution map, another quite common phenomenon for species as they move north is to become more coastal. So you can see that it's avoiding the uplands of Snowdonia here, the, the sort of hill country. And as we get into Northern England and Scotland, it's definitely um, moving towards the coast and is not present in these more upland districts. So this is a, this is a common distribution pattern with um, with shield bugs. If we look at the dock bug, Coraeus, this is another common and familiar species. Um, and these maps are uh, 2020, by the way, they are data from iRecord. Um, you can see that uh, it's doing really well now and it's, it's present in Yorkshire. Um, and the, historically, this was really quite a, an uncommon southerly species. Well, it was common where it occurred. It was quite a restricted, quite a restricted bug. Again, you can see that absence from uh, upland areas in Wales and uh, possibly parts of the southwest, which are less warm. Now, this red and black species has really shown um, quite a remarkable um, pattern of spread. This is a species called Chorizus hyacyami. And for a very long time, this was really quite scarce. It was very local in Western Britain and Southwest coastal regions. So all around the coasts of Wales, um, around the coasts of Cornwall and Devon, probably also in Dorset and, and perhaps Hampshire. This, <clears throat> this map is rather incomplete because historic data has not been very comprehensively digitized yet. And it was a bug of, of coastal areas feeding on stalks, bill and rest harrow, often growing on sand dunes and, and sandy areas near the coast. And as recently as 2003, Roger Hawkins wrote in his book that it was not likely to occur in Surrey. <clears throat> well, it's now absolutely everywhere. 
in Surrey and well beyond that. And from about 2000 onwards, we've seen um, a very rapid inland and northerly spread. And it's really widespread now in lots of different habitats. <clears throat> it's found on lots and lots of different hosts and it can be a, a really common garden species. And interestingly, it's even cropping up in quite high altitude cold areas like Weirdale in uh, Northumberland. And this, is, this map is for 2014. But if we uh, fast forward to now, <clears throat> we can see that it's actually reached Northern England and in 2019, it's reached Scotland. And this is remarkable. I, uh, I, ne I never envisaged that Chorizus would get to Scotland so fast, I have to say. And it's an incredible example of uh, range extension. However, it's not as remarkable as something that the box bug has done, Gonocerus acuti angulatus. Now this, <clears throat> this is a truly unprecedented range expansion in this species and made all the more remarkable by the fact that it used to be such an incredible rarity in Britain. So this species was discovered in Britain in 1850 by Douglas, who, who found it at one site in Surrey, Box Hill. And it was called the box bug because it was exclusively associated with box, boxus, which is um, <clears throat> very common at Box Hill. And it was only on these, these bushes at Box Hill and lots of entomologists went to, to sort of twitch it there. Um, up until really quite recently, people were still going to Box Hill to see it. And it was given the status RDB1, which, is, which was the, the highest uh, rarity classification any species can have. It implies that the species is only found at one site in Britain. So very, very rare indeed. So from about 1990, it started to be seen in a couple of other sites in, in Surrey. And after about 1995, it really started to appear in a much more wide area. And it was becoming clear that this thing was moving onto a, a range of different food plants, particularly hawthorn, but a lot of other rosaceous shrubs um, being used by it. So things like buckthorn, uh, alder buckthorn, um, particularly also um, yew apparently, although I've never found it on yew. And by 2014, it, was, it has got as far as Norfolk um, and out to Gloucestershire and Hampshire. And if we fast forward to the present day, it's actually remarkable. It's got all, this, all the way to Devon, um, and it's gone up into Lincolnshire um, and even over to Lancashire, although this record is from a garden centre, so that might well be uh, assisted and imported. And it's not been found in Wales yet, but it's probably only a matter of time. I would expect it to spread along the Welsh coast like that, I would think. So this species has gone from being historically one of Britain's rarest insects to now being present in well over 100 hectares. And, and in the, the status review, it, it has no conservation status. So it's really quite an unprecedented uh, range expansion, a really remarkable remarkable phenomenon. The firebug has also shown quite an interesting, um, interesting pattern of spread. So if we go back to historic times, um, when Southwood and Leston wrote their Land and Water Bugs of Britain in 1959, this species was only found at one site in Devon. It was actually a tiny little island off the southern coast of Devon. And it's a, a little rock called the Ore Stone Rock. I don't know how big it was, but very, very small, I think. And I don't know how it was discovered or who discovered it. But anyway, it was only present on this Ore Stone Rock for many, many years, um, feeding on mallow. And since then, in the last sort of 20 or 30 years, um, some other colonies have cropped up. And, and these, these were, um, they were set up by, as a result of, of introductions, accidental introductions in, in horticultural produce. 
but they just formed these very discrete local colonies. And the reason that it never spread beyond those is because long wing forms, uh, which could fly, were never, were never produced here for, for whatever reason. It may be climatic, uh, it may be due to density of the colonies, or no one knows, but this never happened until very recently. Uh, and in fact, in the last few years, there's been quite a few records of these long wing forms um, from Kent, Sussex, Essex, Norfolk, and I think actually other places now. And this suggests that the species now could start to spread quite rapidly. And so all these discrete colonies could start to join up and it could become um, quite a widespread species, particularly around the coast. And there's some evidence that that's starting to happen in Southeast England. So that's, a, that's another interesting, interesting pattern of spread. Right, so sort of dis despite this generally positive picture of, of species prospering and increasing because Britain's getting gradually warmer, um, you have to keep that in perspective and <clears throat> remember that lots of these species which are arriving here or, or increasing are not very specialized and they are essentially sort of generalist species, which are not very fussy. And so they're always going to, going to do well with a, bit, with a bit more warmth. But if you look at the species which are much more ecologically fussy in Britain, then many of these uh, are actually declining and they've shown really clear evidence of um, contracting ranges and historical loss. So yes, as I said, most of these are very specialised ecologically and they live in threatened habitats or they, they feed on um, rare and declining host plants. So obviously if you live on a rare host, you're by definition going to be quite a rare species. So if we have a look at a couple of these, so the cow wheat shield bug, the sydnid, which I mentioned before. So this is a species associated with cow wheat, but it's quite fussy in that it has to have an open aspect. So it's not interested in cow wheat growing in the shade. Um, it will only grow in woodland rides and clearings. It will only feed on cow wheat growing in woodland rides and clearings. And so it relies on rotational management of woods, really, to create these suitable habitats. And it used to be very widespread. Um, in the 19th century, it was a really widespread species, particularly in the Southeast England. It was even found uh, as far north as parts of Scotland. So it, it didn't have, um, you know, it always had a high climatic tolerance. That's not the reason for it being rare, um, but it's definitely declined hugely and, and the abandonment of traditional practices of woodland management does seem to be a big factor in this. You might, if you know about the heath fritillary butterfly, um, this species has real ecological parallels to that. So the heath fritillary is, is a butterfly that feeds on cow wheat. And again, it needs, it needs these open areas. It needs the warmth for the larval stages to develop. And if you go to sites in Kent, like Bleen Woods, where you can see uh, the heath fritillary. You will also find uh, loads and loads of cow wheat shield bugs. And there's also um, sites in Essex where they've reintroduced the heath fritillary. And again, these are, these are good for the cow wheat shield bug. So the two, two species seem to go hand in hand. Another sydnid is also a very rare and much declined species, this thing called the down shield bug, Canthophorus. And this is really only ever found in Britain in the very highest quality unimproved chalk grassland habitats. And it feeds on a scarce plant, which is semi-parasitic, a thing called bastard toad flax, cesium, and this parasitic on grasses. And uh, it's really a very fussy thing. It needs nice sort of heat stressed rabbit grazed swards to persist. And it, if, if sites go at all rank, it will be lost. And it's been, the plant has been lost from many sites and as a result, so too has the bug. 
And yeah, this is often linked to changes in management, grazing, um, <clears throat> myxomatosis may also have played a part. A lot of these cydnids are hard to find because they're ground dwelling and they are quite unobtrusive. So they are easy to overlook. And it's encouraging that um, several records from new sites have come to light for this species. So it would seem to have been overlooked in some areas, which is, which is encouraging. Right, so I'm now gonna go on to talk about the sort of dynamic nature of our fauna and go through some of the species which have recently arrived here. If we think about um, the recent times since 1990, um, 13 species have arrived since then. And, and this, is, this is nearly 20% of the whole fauna. So it's a, it's a remarkable proportion of it. And these things arrive here in one of several ways. So first of all, they can arrive in an unassisted fashion, simply by dispersing from the near continent and just literally flying across the channel, landing here um, and colonizing, becoming established. And this usually occurs in species which are expanding very rapidly on the continent, usually in response to, to a warming climate. So, there are certain species which were pretty certain arrived here in this way, but it's often difficult to know exactly how things have got here. Certainly lots of species have arrived here um, via an assisted route. So they've arrived in horticultural produce or landscaping materials. Um, and in fact, these things can originate from miles away. So even outside Europe because of the, the, the huge global trade in, in plant produce. And in fact, some new developments are pretty much landscaped um, up from, you know, from nothing to an entire finished landscape. So they're literally bringing in plants wholesale and, and it can be really difficult to quarantine these things and biosecurity can be poor. So things are arriving like that pretty easily. Um, but as I said, it's sometimes very difficult to determine exactly how, how these things have got here. So yes, we have this dynamic fauna. And in fact, this can be a complication because species which were here historically have um, you know, um, waned and then reappeared. So are they native or, or are they non-native? And, and in fact, it can be a bit glib to talk about native and non-native species for these very reasons. So if we, if we think about the two stick to pleuris species in Britain, so these, these were historically very, very rare in Britain. They're probably vagrants. And occasionally they became established historically. So they, in the 19th century, there were transitory colonies formed that um, hung on in a few places for a few years. They used to breed here. Um, then they'd go extinct. And in, with these two species, there were no further records, in fact, until the late 1990s. Um, and uh, at which point they both essentially recolonized Britain and established incredibly strongly. And they're now, now very widespread, in fact, as far as, as Yorkshire. Another interesting species is Nazara, the Southern Green Shield bug. And this is native to Africa, but it's been introduced all over the world, pretty much. Uh, in, the, in the tropics, it can be quite a severe crop pest. So it's been arriving in Britain for years um, in vegetable produce, but never ever survived here when it, when it escaped in the wild. It was never able to breed or survive the winter. However, in 2003, um, nymphs were found in the wild and it was, it was able to complete a life cycle. And since then it has become quite well established in London. And in fact, in the last five or 10 years, well, really the last five years, in fact, we've seen records from well outside London. And this is probably um, repeat introductions, independent introductions, rather than the species spreading. And it does appear to be becoming established in other cities. Um, and there are recent records from Manchester, in fact. This often feeds on runner beans in allotments. And it can be a bit of a problem for vegetable growers. Um, it will 
um, reduce the quality of the, the resultant beans that you grow. That is not really a big problem. And in fact, it's only a big economic problem for people growing um, crops under glass in a heated, in a heated uh, situation. So if you've got a heated greenhouse um, producing things all year round, then obviously the bug can um, breed all year round, produce multiple generations um, and build up enough potential to become a problem. But all of these species are, are very much curtailed by the, the British winter. So they're, they're likely to be a high mortality during the average British winter in these sorts of species. And that very much limits their capacity here. Another interesting species is the, the Rambur's pied shield bug. Now, you might know about the pied shield bug, which is pretty widespread in Britain. It likes things like white dead nettle, um, and quite often is one of the first things you'll see in the spring. But a closely related species, this, this uh, Tritomega sex maculatus, was first recorded here in 2011 um, in Kent, and it, it had been expanding very strongly on the continent and arriving in Holland, and we knew it was probably going to get here, and indeed it did. Um, and unlike the pied shield bug, it normally goes on black whorehound, in fact, which is not very often, well, not so frequently used by um, the pied shield bug. So if you want to find this, that's the thing to look, to look for, black whorehound. And it was quite slow to spread, really, to begin with. But the last few years, possibly as a result of the very hot summer we had in 2018, it's really spread quite rapidly. And it spread across London very fast. And this is, this is often uh, the kind of pattern we see with things in London, because London has a, a quite a warm microclimate in general and benefits from the urban heat island effect. Once things get a foothold here, they, they can expand quite rapidly. So it seems to be spreading down river corridors as well as a slight indication that it's doing that. And that might be that black whorehound likes the more sort of gravelly soils associated with, with these types of geologies. Another species which has recently arrived here and in fact is something that is massively common on the continent and, and was thought um, likely to be a, an arrival um, a long time ago in Britain, but paradoxically didn't get here until recently, is this striped shield bug, Graphosoma. This is a massively distinctive species, and it's a really good argument for um, how easy shield bugs are to, to identify and record them. I mean, it's really eye-catching and very, very unmistakable. So uh, this was recorded at two sites in 2020, uh, again in the London area, and uh, usually feeds on umbellifers. So it's quite obvious on the, you know, on the, on the top of an umbel, um, you will not fail to notice it. The host plants in this case were hemlock and hogweed. And although it's been found here previously, it's never really established. And, these do, these do seem to be the first breeding colonies ever recorded. But if you go to any, anywhere on the continent, massively ubiquitous species, and as I said to start with, possibly is very long overdue uh, as a British species. So this is a very topical insect here, perhaps the most sort of um, topical species I'm gonna talk about. It's actually been in the news quite extensively in the last few months. Um, the brown marmorated shield bug, or sometimes called stink bug, the American name, Haliomorpha. Now this again has been moved around the, the whole, pretty much the whole world, although it's native to Asia. It's been introduced into North America where it's very, very common and well-established and also parts of continental Europe. Now, it's very, very polyphagous. That is to say, it can feed on almost everything. It likes feeding on fruit trees, and it can be a, quite a serious pest uh, in very warm climates. And in the winter, large aggregations can also form in, in buildings, and they will get inside houses, and they can be a nuisance. So <clears throat> this, is, this has the potential to be a, a, um, a real pest outside its native range. And it was thought 
that it would arrive in Britain for many years, we've been looking out for it. Um, and indeed in 2020, pheromone traps um, did in fact prove the presence of this species and, and male, male bugs were attracted to them. Now, although these bugs were not necessarily breeding yet, the presence of them in, in these pheromone traps does suggest that they are likely to become established or are becoming established. Um, and they're likely to do so in parts of England, particularly uh, in the London area. And as I said, this, this is an area which benefits from this urban heat island effect and will be particularly suitable for, for them to become established. But despite the big media furore over this, it really is very unclear if it will be a serious pest here. And I don't think so in the short term anyway. I mean, maybe 50 years down the line be a different matter, but um, you know, it depends. Depends on how our wine industry goes and that kind of stuff, I would have thought. So for the remainder of the talk, um, I'm gonna talk about um, this species Leptoglossus occidentalis, the Western conifer seed bug. Um, and this is a really interesting species. It's been here now for about 15 years. And about five years ago, I put together a talk to sort of mark its first decade in Britain. So a lot of the material here um, is borrowed from that talk, but I have updated the, um, <clears throat> the distribution map. Um, but a lot of the, um, the other slides are taken straight from it, so they're not entirely current, but it should, it should be clear as I, as I talk. So this is a massive bug, actually. It's a really quite big Corea, about 20 millimetres long, over a couple of centimetres long. And really spectacular. It's got these leaf shaped um, expansions on the hind legs. Uh, it's really beautifully marked with um, these diamond shaped zigzags on the, on the forewings. Uh, and it's a very impressive, imposing looking thing actually. Now, there's quite a number of species in the genus and they're all found in America with the exception of one. And the species is native to the west coast of North America. And so it's sort of behind the, the Rocky Mountains and it probably could never get over that biogeographic barrier. So it's pretty much um, confined to that west coast. However, um, during the 20th century, it started to spread. Um, it was moved around and it reached the East Coast by 1990s. So it was present across most of North America. And then it started to turn up elsewhere in, in the world because of these, the, the, there are propensity for moving stuff around and introducing um, moving tim timber shipments around. Uh, this thing turned up in timber shipments in Europe. And it was first recorded in Italy, but it spread really quite fast in Europe. And in fact, it reached um, the, the north coast of France and Holland by 2006. So it spread pretty quickly. And once it got there, it didn't stop. It uh, basically flew over the channel to Britain without turning a hair. Um, it's a very strong flyer. And it proceeded to colonize Britain with, with quite extreme rapidity, really. So these things were just bombing over from um, the, the channel and landing here, finding hibernation sites, and then, uh, and then, and then breeding the next year. So the first record was from, from Weymouth uh, in January 2007. But a year later, we started to see really big influxes uh, on the south coast arriving in the autumn when these things start to disperse and look for hibernation sites. And lots of moth trappers were recording them in, uh, in their traps at coastal sites, particularly uh, on the coast near the continent in, in Kent and Sussex. And people were also finding them in their houses. So this thing likes to overwinter in houses and uh, sheltered out buildings sometimes. So ecologically, it feeds pretty much on a large range of conifers, a really big range, including Scots pine. So this is the most likely host in Britain, but it also feeds on other ornamental pines, things like Douglas fir, um, 
Pinus nigra black pine, and it feeds on the cones and the flowers and developing seeds. And it has this peculiar long rostrum, particularly when it's a nymph, which enables it to do this. Now in, in America, it can be a bit of a pest in conifer seed nurseries where they're growing up conifers from seed. Uh, and it, but it only ever produces one generation a year. It's quite a, bit, it's quite a big bug in fact. Um, so it needs quite a long generation time. So here's a, here's a very early instar nymph and you can see the, the rostrum is so long it actually extends beyond the tip of the abdomen. Uh, in a slightly later instar, this is the final instar, but again, you can see the rostrum is still relatively very long and it's reached the tip of the abdomen. So this is an adaptation for feeding on pine cones. So in order to monitor the arrival of this species, we put it into a project called RISC which was something BRC developed in 2010. Now RISC stood for Recording Invasive Species Counts. So this is a bit misleading because not every species in this project was, was truly invasive. I mean, most of them were probably quite benign in fact, but um, it, was a, it was a way of monitoring non-native species. And of course, RISC forms a, a sort of nice catchy acronym. So the idea was to use it to further our understanding and of the distribution of these non-natives. And it was one of the first initiatives to use an online recording interface. So as before I record, which was um, rolled out in 2012. So it was before that. And we put three species of Hemiptera into it, three non-native species, as well as Leptoglossus, uh, the Southern Green Shield bug, Nazara, was entered into risk and also the rhododendron leafhopper, graphocephala. Um, that Leptoglossus we thought was a really um, particularly suitable candidate for this kind of approach because it's very spectacular and big, noticeable and large uh, and easy to identify. And also the fact that it enters houses means that it sort of comes to the recorder. So it was not being found by entomologists particularly, but it was just turning up randomly in people's houses, particularly people that live near um, areas with lots of pines. So yeah, the species comes to the recorder. And if we could just find these people that are getting it in their houses and make it easy for them to submit the records, could potentially track the, the colonization really well. So we used an online recording form where you could submit your sightings. And this allowed uh, a photo upload facility like you can now have in iRecord. And people were able to upload their photos to allow verification. And this was a really great way of corroborating their sightings. So on this slide, I've just got five photos of Leptoglossus. And these are examples of probably amongst the worst photos submitted um, using the online recording form for the species. And I think that the sort of take home message from these five pictures is, it, is that however bad you are at using a camera and however bad your camera actually is, is pretty much impossible to take a photo of Leptoglossus um, in which it can't be recognized. So these are all truly appalling photos. Um, the bugs either completely out of focus in a really, um, opaque pot, tiny in the frame or massively underexposed. And yet in all five of them, you can clearly see uh, what it is. So it was a really, really good species for, for this kind of approach. So we opened up this online recording facility and uh, in 2011. So yeah, uh, this was before I record. And already by March the 12th, by March 2012, we had um, well over a hundred records. And what was interesting is they, they weren't all from the south coast. They were massively scattered across England and Wales. And in fact, the, the species even reached up to the Isle of Man um, and up into Northern England really, really fast. So if we look at the current distribution on the NBN, 
um, by, by 2020. We actually see that there are as many as 4,000, in excess of 4,000 records. And you can see that the distribution is really consolidated quite nicely across a large part of England and Wales. There's still relatively few Scottish records. Um, there was concerns that the species may become a, um, a problem in our native pine forests, but it doesn't seem to have got that far north. And again, there's evidence that it's quite coastal up here. These very extreme northerly records are our import, so it's coming in sort of Christmas trees, things like that. This North Sea record, it's not an error, that's on, on an oil rig. Um, so these things are, are flying strongly, uh, making really quite long dispersals across the sea. Uh, and in fact, there's no evidence to suggest it stopped trying to disperse. So in 2016, uh, a, a huge number were recorded on a boat off the coast of North Norfolk. So it's a, a, an incredible insect when it comes to sort of active flight and, and dispersal capabilities. So if we look at the records by months, now this is um, not based on the current data. So this is really only up to 2016. So this is looking at only a thousand records, which was pretty much what we had um, five years ago, you can see that the, there's this very big peak in the autumn months. And this is when the adults are looking for their hibernation sites um, prior to the winter. So they're coming inside, people are finding them uh, and recording them. Very few records in midsummer when this species is a nymph. So it's probable that this, the, the bug is really quite unobtrusive in midsummer possibly feeds quite high up sometimes out of sight. It's not a terribly easy thing to find, even if you do a lot of beating of conifers. You can be lucky, but can be really difficult to find. So this is an insect that, that entomologists don't find easily, and it's not something you can go out and look for. Most of the records have been, as I said, contributed by, by just members of the public, really. And this is consistent with the uh, records by life stage. So the massively overwhelming majority are of adults um, with just five records of nymphs. And of course, all these nymph records were found on, on Scots pine or, or pines. If we look at the records by um, attribute, then really is clear that people are finding these things when they're hibernating or looking to hibernate. So more than half were associated with buildings, just over half were actually inside buildings, and the next largest proportion were, were in gardens, and after that um, in moth traps. <clears throat> so many of the recorders did comment on the proximity of pines, so they may have had pines in their gardens or nearby, but in fact only a, a small proportion were actually directly associated with with pines. So this is probably because these are not entomologists. These are not people looking on plants to find bugs. They're just simply reporting what they found in their house. And in fact, 12 records, probably a lot more than that now, were associated with laundry. So this is probably uh, the result of uh, laundry on a, on, a, on a washing line functioning as a kind of giant flight interception trap. Um, these big bug landing on it and then of course, drawing, drawing massive attention to itself. Um, and it seemed that bugs seem to come indoors on laundry as well, uh, as we'll, we'll now see. Um, most people seem to quite like them, in fact. Um, it's a truly beautiful bug, never seen one before. Spectacular bug, screen photo, favorite office pet, much less disturbing than wasps and hornets, so that's nice. Flew into my children's nursery in the afternoon. Very impressive bug. Children loved him. Um, the overwhelming uh, majority were positive, which is nice. However, there, there were a few negative um, perceptions associated with the records. And I'm, I'm grateful for the people that felt like that for submitting the record. Um, someone said, in my opinion, it's an ugly insect. I thought it was a kissing bug or vinchuca. It flew into the bedroom and scared the crap out of me. 
And my personal favorite, simply just horrible, please help. Now there are quite a few unusual record attributes with this thing. So it's coming into houses. So quite amusingly crawled onto the person's ear when asleep in bed found in the vegetable tray in my fridge. I mean, God knows how, how it got in there. I had the shock of my life when I took one of these out of a fresh pair, fell out of a fresh pair of boxer shorts that I took out of my airing cupboard this morning. So this is clearly uh, one of the bugs that has been carried into the house on the, the gigantic flight interception trap, which is the laundry on the washing line. Um, the chemical defences, there was also some evidence uh, of this in some of the record comments. So found on the staircase, Kitten took an interest and received a spray for his efforts. So obviously um, excreted some, some volatile, um, volatile compounds, repugnatorial compounds to get rid of this cat. Um, it excreted brown liquid. And also some evidence of it being eaten um, by predators, which I thought was interesting. I put it out on my balcony. Sadly, a jackdaw who I give bread to came and landed on the, the railing, saw the bug, and it went in an instant. And what I think are the most remarkable comments um, on, on, on this amazing data set of records relate to immigration. So someone on the coast landed on my arm very strong, warm southerlies blowing. So clearly sort of classic um, conditions for it, for insect immigration. Someone down at Dungeness, at Dungeness Power Station, these bugs are all over the place this morning. So evidence of a massive sort of fall of migrant bugs. Um, and then you've got the, um, the gas, um, the oil rig um, gas platform record found on Southern North Sea gas platform, 60 miles from back to Norfolk. So just to summarize this final section on, on Leptoglossus, um, of course, there were initial concerns about it being a pest here, but as we've seen from the map, it looks like it's not going to um, consolidate its range any further now. And so it doesn't seem to be well established in the Highland region and it's not going to threaten our native pine forest, which, which is good. Um, but interestingly, from a recording perspective, despite having this great data set, and we know it to be a very widespread bug, it does remain enigmatic. So it's very unobtrusive during the summer for such a big thing. Um, and it's not often found by, by entomologists really. And so in just over a decade, we've got about 4,000 records for this species. And so we've actually achieved better recording coverage for this, this one bug than for some of our native species, um, particularly some of our smaller, um, more secretive ground dwelling native species, which are sort of hard to find. Um, but I think that's remarkable, uh, even, even you know, given that it's just been 10 years, that, that is quite an incredible, um, quite an, an incredible phenomenon really. Um, and the data set is amazing in that it, it is really largely gathered by the general public. Um, and it's not specialist recorders going out and finding this thing. It's a really great example of um, citizen science, if you like. So um, this has been achieved completely by, you know, um, lay people just recording bugs that they found in their house. So just to um, sum up and, and finish off really, um, I'd just like to um, thank everyone who has contributed records. Um, it's absolutely terrific. People are sending in loads and loads of data now. Um, iRecord's been really, really well used. Got over 60,000 records now on iRecord. I've got about another 60,000 records, which we, um, I would like to um, consolidate on our record eventually, but obviously that will take time. So thank you for um, your continuing records, um, however you submit them. And I also should say thank you to uh, Maria and Graham for the photos of Coptosoma, which I, I used. So thank, thank you both very much.
Thank you very much indeed, Tristan. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. And uh, it's just, yeah, really amazing to, to, to see how shield bugs are different ways that they're there and shield bugs and allies, different ways they're coming into the UK. The, the Western conifer shield bug reminds me of, you, you know, saying it's a strong flyer, it sort of reminds me of having a, a, a pheromone lure for an emperor moth and watching it fighting against the wind just to, just to make progress. But see, yeah, that seems, uh, yeah, such, you know, to, you know, really compelling evidence when you've got moth trappers getting it on the, on the south coast um, with, with southerly winds. Um, and I'm really looking forward to, well, I suppose I'd, I'd like to see these shield bugs that have just arrived into the country, even if they're gonna, you know, may well be some pest issues there. Um, you know, I've, I, I, I remember getting green shield bug in Carlisle a, a few years ago and uh, uh, Steve Hewitt, who, uh, who had been there much longer than me, it was said it was a big deal at the time when I didn't really, really, realize just to, to see that one in, in North Cumbria. So yeah, it's yeah, it's really good to get to get this overview of what's going on in, in the whole country. And to, so you can sort of put your records in perspective for the, those in the Northwest or, or anywhere else. Um, so, so thank you very much indeed. That, yeah, absolutely fascinating. Okay, uh, well, I think we'll, we'll go into to questions now, if that's okay, Tristan. Um, so the the first one we had uh, was from Heather Sheely. Um, what predates on shield bugs? And uh, sort of a second part to that question: Are graphosoma poisonous? Yeah. So um, all shield bugs are distasteful. Um, they all produce um, chemicals which um, are designed to repel predators. Um, probably smaller predators, to be honest. I mean, something like a bird, a big bird, um, it, it will always be able to eat, eat a shield bug. Um, but yeah, they probably don't taste that good. To, um, these, these chemicals are, are very volatile and they smell very strongly. So they release very quickly. They're, they evaporate really quickly from the, the specialised um, cuticular surface that these insects have and create quite a powerful um, um, sort of defensive aroma which does does repel a lot of predators in fact. Um, there are some specialist predators of um, shield bugs actually there are there are other insects which will stock their nest burrows um, with shield bugs so there's a wasp called a starter boops, which collects usually the nymphs of, of shield bugs and brings them back to the to its um, nest burrow um, and lays their eggs um, on, on those nymphs. And they and the, the the young larvae will develop on on those um, provided nymphs. Um, and so that's a, a very specific predator. Um, so yeah, there are there are many things which which will eat them. Yeah. Okay, Th thanks, Tristan. Um, okay, we'll go to a, a question from uh, Dave. Actually, Dave, on the who, who's got his hand up? Would you like to unmute yourself, Dave? Uh, I would think it's just a good book, please. I have. A very small pocketbook, but a couple of those that were mentioned earlier um, went in it. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem with books is they are quite out of date now for this group. So I can't really recommend. Um, uh, well, I can recommend a book. I mean, the, the books by Paul Brock are probably um, the most current, the most up to date. So. Um, yeah, I, he's got a book coming out very soon, I think, which will have um, even more species in it. But um, I mean, you see, my problem with with um, producing a book for for these for this group, and in fact, bugs in general, is that the fauna is changing so fast, um, 
and it's really it, it rather puts you off producing something printed um, because I, I keep thinking well I must do an atlas um, but then of course you, you think well it might be completely out of date in five years um, and so I you know I'll wait um, but I agree we, we must have we must have printed literature it's really important but yeah if you want one book um, or two books I would recommend the books by Paul Brock yeah Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll go to the next question then now. This is from Jeff. Um, are there any new records for Eurydema dominulus? If, if not, are there any conservation initiatives in place to help save the species? Um, well, no, Eurydema dominulus is, <clears throat> is really very uncommon. And there aren't very many recent records at all. Um, I've never, that's one of the few species I've, I've never seen um, in Britain. In fact, I've never seen it anywhere. Is, is this got a vernacular name, Tristan? Uh, the Scarlet Shield Bug. Yeah. It's, um, the problem with trying to conserve it is that, um, you know, it's, I don't know that it's known from anywhere that's protected. And um, I think maybe we could do some, do some survey work for it. That might be a more useful thing um, than out and out directed conservation right now. I mean, I don't think it would be worth sort of trying to do captive breeding or reintroductions or anything like that. Um, I mean, it's not really clear why it's so rare. It's really, uh, it's unusual. Um, it's something that ought to be doing better. Most of the Eurydema species uh, are, you know, um, the other two Eurydema species are doing much better here recently. They're both expanding. Why, why Dominulus is, has become so rare, it, it is a bit of a mystery. I mean, it could be something that, uh, that likes quite precise woodland management conditions again. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I forget the details actually. I, I mean, I would, um, I would have to remind myself reading the, the status review for that species really. Something I'm, I'd never encountered and I don't know a great deal about really. Okay, but a, a southern, southern distribution yeah, I mean it's Kent and Kent, the Kent and Sussex border really is where where most of the records are from, and it's a uh, it's a species that likes um, cuckoo flower, uh, but may use other brassicas, um, but it's 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 always been quite rare in Britain, I think. Um, I I don't I don't know really what we could what we could do in, in terms of conserving it um, it's not it's ecological requirements don't seem you know well sufficiently well defined for for you to just say this is you know this would be a good way of uh, managing for the species in the same way that it'd be very easy for to manage for those two species I talked about which are declining um, because they have quite well known ecological requirements it's it's not so clear to me why um why Dominulus is, is, has got so rare. Um, so would the next step for that one be more study, understanding the I, biology? Yeah, I, I, think, I, I think so. I think you'd need to do some quite specific survey work for it before, um, yeah, before you try to do any kind of specific conservation management or reintroductions or anything like that. I, don't know that that's appropriate really now. Okay, thanks Tristan. I will go to a, an, another question from the chat, this time from um, Catherine Jones. Will the species that are expanding their ranges, e.g. box bug and fire bug, cause any ecological issues or will they fit into the British fauna? No, I mean, most, most of the time um, with these species that are expanding their ranges and, and even with species that are arriving uh, for the first time, their impacts are pretty benign. They don't generally cause many problems. 
Um, and I mean, <clears throat> the, the, the box bug is um, feeding on lots and lots of common species of, of um, you know, rosaceous shrubs and trees. And there's going to be no, no issues with that. I mean, plants are very rarely limited by, you know, herbivory pressure on them. So it's not, that's not going, it's not going to be an issue. Um, in the same way, I, I don't see the firebug uh, causing an issue with um, competition or impacts on, on its hosts, no. Okay, that's, that's good news. Um, okay, has, anyone, has anybody got a question from the floor? I'll take one if anyone would like to stick their hand up now. Otherwise, I'll go back to the questions in the chat. Okay, I'll do another question from the chat. Okay, this one from um, Elaine Wright. Um, any tips on where or how to acquire a suction sampler? Is modifying a leaf blower the best bet? And I know, uh, I think Steve McWilliam replied saying there's a uh, <clears throat> an electric Black & Decker one works, works well um, for him. Um, what do you use, Tristan? Um, yeah, a, um, a garden garden vac. Um, so, th th you know, there are several big petrol driven models, or you can get an electric uh, electric battery driven one. I've got um, I've got both. I think there might be one or two specific um, sort of s suction samplers that this and they're sold as that, but they're quite expensive but i think uh our, our our colleague wanted one just to be able to justify it more easily on a plane as as some as something that that, that was the purpose of it rather than being yeah, i mean the, the the electric ones are um you know they're they're lighter um you don't have to mess about putting petrol in them so and they're much more portable you could take them around, carry them around much more easily. They're not as powerful and you, you can't use them in, in uh, damp habitats, for example. Um, but yeah, probably a battery driven one would be a good first, good first one to get. And then if you really get keen on suction sampling, get a more powerful petrol driven one. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the two makes of petrol driven ones people tend to use are McCulloch and steel. Um, steel are those sort of their orange and white plastic. Uh, yeah, the steel one's probably your best actually, I think. Yeah, I've, I've, I've certainly seen other entomologists and arachnologists with, with, with them. Um, okay. Thanks, Tristan. I'll go to another question. Um, right, this is a this is a long one here. Okay, this is one from Emma Williams. In regards to conservation and preservation of habitat, will there be a way forward in regards to ecology surveys? As currently, invertebrates and fungi often receive zero representation on large scale developments, with concern and surveys only shown to higher status species such as bats. Surely this can't continue as we will undoubtedly lose species in the UK with loss of habitat as no consideration is given with mitigations or offsetting. Is there a way to ensure invertebrates are given a louder voice in development, ecology or land management? Or land management? Um, well, um... Not really related to shield bugs, but nevertheless, I will attempt an answer. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think my, I think many more, many more invertebrates are included in in surveys than used to be. Actually, I, I, I think um, you know the picture is more positive than it was. Um, certainly, organisations like Bug Life have raised the profile of invertebrates massively. Um, and I think certainly in the, certainly uh, in the southeast, um, 
particularly in Essex and Kent, there, there is a great pressure on, um, <clears throat> on developers to have invertebrate surveys done. In fact, particularly uh, on open mosaic habitats, post-industrial sites. Um, I, I think that you know the situation is in, is improving in that in that regard, and um, in the next few years, there's going to be this requirement to demonstrate the net biodiversity gain as a result of developments, and uh, that may be that may be a good thing for invertebrates too, um, because people will have to fulfil their obligations, um, you know, based on law. Um, it would be part of the planning process. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not saying that your, your, your concerns are not founded. They very much are. And there are, there are undoubtedly projects where invertebrates are not considered and they should be. Um, I mean, my way of, of raising the profile of invertebrates is, is uh, you know, developing things like the, the the bugs website so that um, these insects are not the kind of obscure niche group that they were previously perceived as being and 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 become a much more mainstream well-known group um, and therefore they are just taken more seriously by virtue of the greater exposure and familiarity that people have with them so, I mean, if you think back 20 years ago, people probably didn't know much about shield bugs, but now everyone can identify a shield bug. You know? So um, it's, uh, I think things are moving in the right direction. The, the main problem is that um, there's more and more pressure on, um, you know, on habitats which are rich in invertebrate life. Uh, and that, that's, that's really the crux. Um, certainly, um, you know, development sites do threaten really valuable habitat now, and we need to make sure that these, you know, these these um, safeguards are there. Yeah, I, th I think. Um, I mean, there's, there's, at a species level, there are there are very few fully protected invertebrates in, in this country. Mm. Mm. Um, there's, there's, there's currently, there's a, a, I think they review it every five years. The, the, I think there's a re review of that, of the, uh, of the protected species at the moment. So that may seem more, more added or, or perhaps uh, things become, certain things become unprotected if they... Well, is that under the Wildlife and Countryside Act? Is that, that I think that's yes. being updated now, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, but I, I, but I think most most of the most really rare things are are, are on protected sites. Uh, well, in may, may perhaps not in in the southeast, but in in the northwest, most of the threatened species, and I and I know most of them. Um, and they're mostly yeah mostly on on managed, you know on on triple SIs managed by countryside hmm. agencies or wildlife trusts or, or national trusts and organizations like that. So on, on, on development sites, there's, there's virtually no protected invertebrates here anyway. So, so it's, it's more at a, at a habitat or community level really that it hmm. needs to happen. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. Um, it's a big, it's a very big topic. Uh, so, um, but um, th yeah, thank you, thank you, Tristan. And, and did did you have any follow up on that, um, Emma? Well, I'm I'm actually based in Wales, um, and uh, what's coming up again and again and again in big, very big developments, including our own Welsh Assembly, they're not surveying um, for invertebrates. Um, and just just this week now, I've been uh, helping a, a, a farmer out that he's been evicted. Um, his farm has ancient woodland, and the ecology only covered bats, mammals, um, and a very limited um, survey for amphibians and reptiles. 
no invertebrate surveys were done, no fungi surveys were done, which are obviously the fungi and invertebrates work together. Um, and um, on, I've actually, uh, there's lacewing beetles there. Uh, just yesterday, I went back there um, and there's the, the rare fungus beetle. I've not started yet um, on um, the other groups of uh, invertebrates. So obviously the weather's warming up now, so I'm gonna start on those next week. But I'm I'm doing this to, you know, just off my own back for him. But um, they've been completely ignored. And I asked two years ago, you need to do invertebrate surveys there. This is a, an ancient woodland, hasn't been done. And they've, the Welsh Assembly have accepted the ecology report, and they're now gonna cut through that ancient woodland um, because there's nothing major there from the mammal surveys. It's gonna cause an issue or a headache, but not, there's nothing down for the invertebrates. What well, harm is gonna be caused to the invertebrates that are there, which obviously also feed a higher food chain as well. Um, and it's just, I, my head, I sort of hit a brick wall thinking, what can I do now to actually, is there a way you can force hands and say, look, no, you're doing a survey. I'm not accepting a no, you're doing a proper ecological survey for invertebrates. Is there any strings that I can actually pull that are relevant and legal to make them do an invertebrate survey in an ancient ash woodland? And meadows um, as well. There's meadows there, there's things that head it's, really, it's really difficult. It's really difficult because even if you did have a, a really good invertebrate survey, would that demonstrate enough to, would it carry enough weight to, to do um, well, if there's no invertebrate survey done at all, there's no mitigation work. So, mm. for instance, um, species that are um, host specific, and we've also got ancient hedgerows there, and there's no botany surveys that have been done either. Um, so, we, without the mitigation work, because we are aware there's a, a species present, means that nothing is moved. So, everything will be um, uh, chipped. So, any felling going on, any hedgerows felled, any trees felled, they'll all be chipped, that's destruction of habitat. Any uh, plants which are host specific um, will just be torn up and destroyed. Nothing more, nothing translocated because the mammal surveys have brought nothing back of a concern to the development. So there are no bats or? or yeah, yeah, there's bats there. Birds. Yeah, they, they go in to put some, um, some bat boxes up. They're gonna do bits and pieces for the bats, um, but there's nothing else there that's gonna cause them a headache. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's bad, there's, Bad just comes through. There's there's other things, but they go in to do mitigation for the bats, but nothing else. And that is absolutely terrifying. That's an ancient woodland, ancient hedgerows, um, ancient pasture. You know, old soil pasture with set aside fields and stuff. Um, and the the biodiversity there is huge. Um, but no, without them actually surveying and then mitigating for what they find in a, in an official survey. There is no mitigation. So, and that's, and that, I don't think, unless you, unless people are actually involved in um, groundwork ecology work with planning, with development, I don't think people realise how terrifying it is. It's because the habitats are destroyed and without mitigation, then nothing is done to preserve what was there. That's frightening. Um, and I, I just, I, I had a chat to, you know, on the British Ecology page about this, um, so the last 24 hours, and it, it comes back at the same time. Nothing's been done and things are only going to get worse, not better, only worse. And I just feel as if maybe the invertebrates, um, you know, all need to work together and say, look, hang on a sec, we need to start demanding surveys are done, because if you're not doing a survey, if you're not finding evidence of, of species presence, neither are you obliged to do mitigation work for that species. So you could have, a, you know, horse plants wiped out, tree holes wiped out, um, and nothing done for them. So it's complete loss at that site. And there may be no nature corridor, there may not be any other site for them. That may be the only location in that county, and they can get wiped out. And it's, it's terrifying. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing to do would be to object at the planning, you know, at the planning stage. Yeah, make, yeah. Make an objection. But that's what we're doing it again now. Um, so I went up again up yesterday to see where, where other invertebrates I could find there, because I thought, oh, well, but, you know, there's lace, there's lace wing beetles there, but that's good. They were red data. They only came off red data two years ago, um, and they're present in that woodlands. But, well, that's, that's a good one. I've already found the rare fungi there, because I'm in my college, so I found the rare fungi there. 
And then I'm, now I'm adding the invertebrates and they're just going, oh yeah, but you know, no, we're not going to do another survey. No, we're not going to do another survey. Um, so now I'm putting in a full objection now. Um, uh, they're giving us two weeks to do this work. I, I'm doing this off my own back for the farmer because he doesn't want to be, he doesn't want his farm to, to be lost. Um, this is Welsh development plan, you know, uh, build. Um, uh, so now it's just, I'm just wondering, are there any strong strings I can pull within the UK to say, look, Welsh Assembly, you have to do surveys. You need to do invertebrate surveys to allow for mitigation work. If there's anything that can be done to safeguard um, no, some of the habitat and transportation. I mean, there, unfortunately, there, there is no sort of legal requirement. No. Most, most invertebrate surveys are done as a kind of insurance policy so that the developer can have some assurances if the yeah. question comes up during the planning, was an invertebrate survey done? They can say yes, here, and here are the results. That's the sad state of affairs that we're in, I'm afraid. But the, the reality is that more invertebrate surveys get done than they used to. And so yeah. that from that point of view, things have improved. But, you know, I agree with you, things are still grievously poor, particularly in some parts of the world. And um, I can sympathize entirely with the scenario that you're outlining. Completely seen it hundreds of times. Yeah, I, it's, it's, it's very, it's very, very sad, um, Emma, but it, your, your, your case is, is, is not a rare one, which no. is even, even sad, sadder thing. And, uh, you know, I know very often is the case, you know, only what is legally legally obliged to do the protected species surveys and, and that's all that gets done. As I said, there's a very, very small number of invertebrates in this country that have have full legal protection. Yeah, I mean, Dave, what Dave was saying, um, he makes a very good point. It should invertebrate conservation shouldn't be based on single species approaches really it should be valuing placing a value on the assemblage as a whole being much more holistic um, that's what i think is the main value in doing an invertebrate survey it's not i mean conservation is completely flawed in this country isn't it we can't just pick and choose great crested newts or you know a few bat species i mean it's nonsense you want to be holistic look at everything and and that's even more important with invertebrates because they are hugely diverse you get a big community of many species um, and some of those communities although they might not contain lots of rare species still adds up to something ecologically you know important i i yeah it's uh i i would emma i would uh try and round up as many uh <laughs> entomologists in, in your area in the next couple of weeks as you as you can and and make your your complaint your your objection as as, as strong as you can um and i do, the problem is with lots of uh sort of farmland areas and remote areas that recorders tend to not uh go on to private land uh well, well they, they do, but there's so there's huge areas of farmland that never would have been looked at before. Um, but, you know, getting all the records together, going to the source of records and seeing what's being recorded there as well to to try to, to use in your in your objection. Um, go to the local record centre, to the MBN Atlas, to um, any any other major sources that you know of. To be fair, to Sue Breck in, in Wales that are amazing, you know, with um, with the information that, that they provide for the South Wales region, um, and that information is there. But the ecologists, uh, the ecologist firm, didn't use that information. They, you know, they didn't even do a desktop survey for invertebrates. Right. Okay. So I know um, it's there. Uh, <laughs> oh, but it's, it's still great advice. So I'm going to take all this on board, and I'm going to, yeah, like you said, just just keep rounding people up and. Um, I, and well, Colin Cheeseman, who was um, our plant life, he's actually now the ecologist for the area. Um, so hopefully, with his background, he'll be a little bit more um, supportive of the conservation side of work. Um, being the county ecologist now, that they'll be looking at this planning application. So yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, I think I think 
I know invertebrates need more people like you, Emma, to mm. be so you know passionately on that on their side. Um, I think I will. I realise quickly, Gary. Please, I realise okay. you've got a problem on your hands, and you've no time really to make an attempt at any solution. But organisations such as Bug Life, which is one we've got that that will uh, will stand its ground and, and make big noises. This sort of example you're giving something that ought to be in their repertoire of arms uh, to argue the case across the UK. I mean, you're talking on, on a specific, but I'm sure that's going on all the time. Yeah, like you're saying, uh, and really, I can guess such as Bug Life may be representative that can make it make a bigger noise across the UK in general and make them aware of all what you've been discussing. Certainly, will do. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, sorry, Gary, I keep putting in. No, no, that's fine. And and there's um, there's some interesting comments from from a, from a few people in in the chat as well. So we're worth looking at those um emma but i think we'll 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 move on now to to another question um okay this this one from um thomas heathwaite um uh, brilliant talk thank you very much my, my question is this do you think some of the the rarity in species historically is due to a lack of recording um, yeah, that's a good question, um, and there's definitely an element of truth to that. And I think there were certain species historically that people didn't know how to find, um, or they were less easy to find using the methods that people used historically. I mean, obviously, we didn't have, you know, suction samplers for one thing, um, but the Victorians were pretty good at finding insects, and um, they, you know, they did a very good a very good job really of, of um, breaking the back of you know the, the distribution of, of, of the British species at that time. So I would say that in the main the answer to your question is no actually and I don't think there are very many very many species where um, we could say that yeah we really we really understand a lot more about their ecology and how to find them easily now. You know, the Victorians made a pretty good fist of it, really. Um, Tristan, when you when you um, talk about certain species that have come and had temporary colonies, which have then disappeared, mm. um, if if that were happening now, it's, it's not going to be the same as what we're, because there's so many recorders it's not going to be like one of the species that are suddenly colonized now it's found it's actually found everywhere but when the victorian times it, they just thought it was in a few places because of the fewer recorders and it, it couldn't be one of the the things that have come in now could suddenly disappear from being so widespread or do you think that's a different well yeah that's possible um remember there was a lot more collecting in those days so you know um I think if these things weren't extremely rare historically, like you're suggesting, um, there would be more specimens of them in museums. And the fact that there aren't probably means that they were pretty rare. Um, because, you know, that's how entomologists work then. They're, they're, or anyone interested in insects would just, you know, collect them and, um, and keep, the, keep the specimens. Okay, thank you. Um, right, I'll take an, another question from the, the chat now. Um, this is from Sarah Hearn, and um, well, I might be able to help with this one. Uh, this is a, I have a very basic question about iRecord. Are the entries verified? And if so, who can be a verifier? Is iRecord linked with iNaturalist or is that completely separate? I've seen a massive rise in the number of these apps and their popularity, and I'm struggling to work out if there's any sort of quality control going on. Okay, so um, iRecord is the system set up and endorsed by the Biological Records Centre, and it's specifically designed for the British fauna. Um, it's a very functional system that allows records to be verified 
uh, if they're accompanied by a photograph, for example, um, they can be objectively verified by people who are set up on the system to verify records. Um, for example, myself and, se and several others. So iRecord is a really good way of submitting records. It's the best way of submitting um, records. And in fact, it's really, it's really the only way of using an online recording system um, to submit a record. You can obviously send the data to me in a spreadsheet, um, is equally okay. Um, but iNaturalist is not a biological recording system. It's not an online recording system. It's really, um, it's a way of um, interacting with experts and getting a consensus from a very wide variety of specialists who might be uh, outside Britain, all over the world, in fact, on the identification of something which could be anywhere in the world. So it's not, it's not unique to Britain, it's not designed for, to, for Britain. And if you put your records on iNaturalist, they will not go to the national recording schemes. Um, and they will not be verified by, from a British point of view, by, by experts in Britain. So I would strongly advise you, if you're interested in biological recording and contributing to the recording scheme, please put your records in iRecord and do not put your records on iNaturalist. Um, I, I've had problems with records from, from iNaturalist. There was a time when they would come automatically from iNaturalist into iRecord, and we've had quite a lot of problems with that. Um, and I think other recording schemes, I don't know if anyone here can comment, but I've heard that there have been problems with other groups too. So um, in a nutshell, yeah, that would be my feelings. Okay. Thanks, Tristan. That's uh, it's, that's very easy to sort of, um, as as Ashley Whiffens put it, very easy to sort of open a can of worms with with talking about recordings and systems and things. Um, as as a Tniptra project, um, we've always been very much promoting um, iRecord, um, and and we and we know over the course of the project, well, the last. Four years, well, I think it's four years today, really, the project sort of uh, got going. We've, um, we've, we've seen a bit, quite a big change in, in the number of uh, verifiers on iRecord just in that, in, that, in that time and sort of the percentage of records that, that get verified and, and, and often faster than, than they used to as well. Um, I'm, I'm still getting records verified from a few years ago now as it, as it, is, it just an, seems to be ever increasing the, the coverage of, of different groups um, on iRecord and um, you know it's the the app has, 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 has improved since that first came out on, on your on your phone and it's all well linked to the to the desktop um, the you know, website login and uh, yeah I from since since I started with it in the Tempter project. I just think it's, you know, I'm not put off at all really by it. I think it's got better and better and uh, we will continue to, to promote it. And most of the recording scheme organizers that have, well, the, the run invertebrate recording schemes and that have done talks or workshops um, for us in, in the museum or via webinars, you know, I'd say the vast majority are, are in, up, promote it as as well. Um, so that's that's. I think I think we'll move on from that quite quickly because we could have a, a a good long a long time to debating the ins and outs of different recording systems. Um, okay, I'll go to a question from um, Coughnod Richard. Um, are any shield bugs capable of, capable of biting people? In other words, any to be careful of holding? Um, some hemitra can give you quite a nasty bite, um, but you know, most of the shield bugs are not really in that group. No, I would have said not. You're, you're more likely to get a nasty bite from a water bug or um, a red beard, a sassin bug, something like that. Um, even a, even a nabid. Um, having said that, uh, I don't know if, if any of the predatory shield bugs did try and really 
have a go at you. I'm not sure what it would be like. It might be fairly, fairly painful, but it's certainly not happened to me. Um, or, you know, I've not heard anyone who it's happened to either. So, in fact, it's often the smaller um, anthocorid bugs like um, Anthocoris nemorum that's really common in gardens. That can give people quite a nasty little um, stab, actually. It's fairly painful. Okay, um, um, Keith, Keith Fowler, Keith Fowler saying, says that blue shield bugs can bite. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me, to be honest. Okay, I'll uh, I'll have to watch out for them. I'm, <laughs> yeah, they've never got me. I'm I'm always very careful with the aquatic aquatic bugs, but um, mm, yeah, they're they're the worst, undoubtedly. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, at this point then, do we have any 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 questions from the floor? Anyone's uh, anyone got any anything they want to say? Anyone want to speak it? No, not at the moment. Okay, we'll go to another one in the chat then. Uh, this one from Kieran Huston. Are similar numbers of Macroptus, macroptus uh, individuals of the firebug produced each year or are more produced in some years than others? Yeah, it definitely varies. Um, and, and the factors that influence the production of long winged forms usually related to ecological pressures, but we don't know that much about it. It's obviously um, there's obviously genetic and environmental factors as well, because if you think about the firebug, um, genetically capable of producing long wing forms, but it never did it in Britain until recently. So that suggests it could be um, a climatic effect, but it could be that it could also be that the colonies um, have only started to do it when they became a certain size and you've got a certain density of individuals. Or, so there could be density dependent effects. I mean, usually when, when populations start to get really big and um, dense and start to exhaust their resources, that's what drives the development of long winged forms. And then obviously those, uh, those um, insects can, can disperse and, and colonize new habitats and take the pressure off the, the, the sort of existing habitat patch. I mean, that's why it occurs. That's the adaptive reason for it. So yeah, um, it would definitely be great variation probably in terms of uh, when, when these macroptorous forms occur and how many are produced. Thanks, so is, is, has that, how often has it happened with the, with the firebug? Do you only have a few records of Quite a few, quite a few photos now where where macropterous bugs are, you know, do feature. Um, the thing with these fire bugs is that people send they form quite big aggregations, particularly after hibernation. So people will send a photo, and there could be sort of ten or twelve bugs in the photo. So you can look at them all and see if there are any long wing forms. So I've been through a lot of photos and. Um, there, there are at least five or six recent records from all lots of different counties where these long wing forms have been recorded. So, yeah, it seems to be quite seems to be happening quite frequently now. Right. Um, okay. Question from Jeff: Do you know of any reintroductions of shield bugs in the UK? Do you no. think shield bugs could be bred in captivity? So two. That's not that's not something that's been used um, to shield bugs. No, captive breeding's never been never been something that's been used as a um, in, in conservation. I mean, you know, the, it's not generally um, generally from vertebrates. You you know, if you manage the habitat appropriately for the species, it will survive and. Um, flourish in that environment um, and if you're talking about captive breeding and introduction as well you know I'd worry about that approach personally um, it's all very nice you know breeding up the checkered skippers and whatever and you know it looks very nice but I know I, I 
I, I don't think it's that that necessary or appropriate for many invertebrates. So completely separate from the from the idea of uh, introduction, just just rearing a shield bug for for interest to to watch it go between its nymph stages is is that easy for for some species? Yeah, that's very easy to do. Yes, rearing shield bugs in in you know um, outside their natural environment in captivity is really, is a pretty simple thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Even for the predatory ones. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You simply provide them with with enough prey. Um, I mean, the, they they need enough, you know, they need enough heat as well, and that's for warmth. Um, but no, it's not not in itself difficult to rear to rear bugs. Um, and you could breed, you could easily breed them up in numbers. But you know, if the, if the habitat they're in is suitable for that to occur. And they will they will easily do it themselves without a problem. Yeah, um, I mean it's Stop. not, and these things can disperse pretty well most of them too. So, you know, I think the things that lend themselves to reintroductions are species which are really poor to disperse potentially, um, and, and are very very localized. And then you can increase their ranges by by introducing them. But bugs are pretty dispersive things in general and you know they they don't they they shouldn't really require that kind of approach has never never been used as far as i'm aware okay great thanks tristan i've seen yeah i've seen some great pictures of the different instars from maria where she's sort of reared them mm. um but uh, i uh okay well I, I don't see that there's any more questions in the chat um and i don't see anyone's sort of hand raised so if that's it we'll leave it there